Well, first things first, I, if you could excuse me for a second, you can talk amongst yourself. I don't know if you heard this earlier, there was there's someone in a room next to mine and they're playing loud music. I want to tell them to try to turn it down. Oh, yeah. I wasn't sure oh, what I that was. Oh, I couldn't hear it. I didn't hear it. I think it was before you came on, though. So I'll yeah, be think... right back. Okay. Can you hear, like, a whirring noise in the background of my audio? I mean, very, very faintly. Like, it's not anything that's... That music. Okay, now I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, now I hear it. Are you nostalgic, a parent, or perhaps a child at heart? When it comes to children's media, from books to TV shows, and even movies, there's often more than meets the eye. Is it well written? Does it still hold up today? What works and what doesn't? Or maybe you wonder what went on behind the scenes of that work. Together, a trio of adults who are also kids at heart, will critique and comment on one piece of children's media each episode. Hello, this is Eric. Hi, I'm PJ. And I'm Rico. You're listening to Beyond the Lens, a family-friendly podcast. Welcome to this new episode of Beyond the Lens. As it's getting closer to that time of year, I figured it would be appropriate to go over some Christmas shows that were aimed towards kids. And this is my pick, and it happens to be the Christmas movie Merry Christmas, Drake and Josh. So, how familiar are you guys with the TV show, Drake and Josh, that the Christmas special is based off of? Well, I started watching it when I was a kid. Uh, there, there was one day I was just channel surfing, and I came to Drake and Josh. It was the episode of Paging Dr. Drake, where Drake impersonated a doctor when Josh had to get foot surgery. Yes, yes, okay. It's mm-hmm. a good one to start with. Yeah, I think I mentioned this uh, in our Spongebob episode, but I mostly grew up with Nickelodeon, and Drake and Josh was definitely a show that I grew up watching, and it's definitely one of my favorite shows, even to this day. I still occasionally watch it if there are reruns on. I think what's fascinating to me about this show is it's another Dan Schneider production. Now, Dan Schneider is a massive innovator of the teenage and the YA network shows because he's the one that created all that. And then the second in, in, uh, uh, iteration of all that, he created the Amanda show, which spun off and, and had Drake and Josh was spun off, which spun off and had iCarly, which spun off and had Sam and Cat. Then there was, you know, you had Zoe 101, you had Victorious, you have all sorts of different shows that are on even now that he created. He also did the Amanda Bynes show for, I think it was the CWWB, some, one of those channels. Um, that was what I like about you, which I enjoyed. And what he was able to do with that show, which I thought was great, was that he was able to take the audience that watched the Amanda show and grow them up with Amanda Bynes. Um, so the material was a little bit more mature in that she was dating and doing that kind of stuff as opposed to doing a variety show. Um, so I think I think Drake and Josh was one of the best cast shows that he has done. And I think it really reached out to a large audience because it was so balanced with its characters and there was a lot for everyone to enjoy. While we're on the topic of characters, did you guys have a particular character that stuck out to you more that was your favorite? Yeah, in terms of the characters, uh, my favorite character was Crazy Steve because uh, he made whatever scene he was in that much funnier. And uh, I love the actor, too. Uh, Jerry Trainer. he was amazing. And on I Carly, too. He's just a really talented guy. And he definitely brought Crazy Steve to life. Yeah, what I enjoy about him, too, is that they'll, they'll, from what I picture of them working on the set and doing the read-throughs and the 
rehearsals and everything is something will be written a certain way and he'll go, well, can I play with it? And then be able to just go completely insane with it. And I think that's great. Almost, almost like a Jim Carrey esque and a Robin Williams esque vibe to him when he was doing crazy Steve, which I think is great. Uh, Rico, did you have a specific character? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Jerry's fantastic. Uh, Rico, did you have a specific character that you were fond of? Mm, not really. Like, I guess you could say I like all the characters. It's sort of hard to pick just one. That's fair. Um, I yeah. am particularly fond of Helen, who is the movie theater manager. I think she's hysterical. I love her. Oh, she's amazing. It's so funny because I know... <laughs> she theoretically this character should really irritate me because there are people in real life that I know (laughs) that are so fond of somebody and then so not fond of somebody that actually does hard work and it just irritates me so much so in reality I should really dislike this character but she does this plot in such a comedic way that it's just oh god I love it so much Yours is a skew. (laughs) (laughs) I quote, I I do random quotes from this show too. I mean, surprise, it's another show and a television (laughs) special that I quote all the time. South America. What? South America. (laughs) Oh. Um. Oh, gosh. I think what's great about this show that really reflected even more so in this Christmas special, Merry Christmas, Drake and Josh, is the dynamics of all the characters. They interacted well together. They were able to play well off of each other. And you can tell that it was the actors that got along and that were able to play off of each other's acting skills as opposed to other actors who are just pretending to be these characters and are pretending to have fun. There's so much of these characters that are innately in the performers themselves and because they all get along on set they're able to really play with each other as performers and actors as well as the characters and i think that is really brought out in this christmas special as well Mm -hmm. oh absolutely like i don't know if you guys like keep up with josh peck but he does have a youtube channel Uh and i'm actually subscribed to him and he's still like friends with all the other cast members uh-huh. i mean miranda cosgrove yep just came back in that, a yep. vlog of his oh that was like one of the best videos i had mm-hmm. ever seen and it just warned me. i'm like my childhood is still there it's it's alive and well and it was mm-hmm. so so great to see that they're still friends and still talking to each other it's, oh it God. just warms my heart the video of him going around and telling everyone that his wife is having a baby is one of my favorite videos yes. that ever come out of the internet. Oh my gosh, everyone freaking out. It's just so it's everything that I want out of a out of a YouTube video. It it it's all the happiness and the joy and the and the crying and John Stamos. <laughs> 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 so good because I like that he gets he keeps in contact with with his grandfathered cast too, which I think is great. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think the show did a did a very good job. I like I love all the performers. I think they're all great actors. I think they're all great comedians, and that's something mm-hmm. very very hard to do, especially on a children's or teenage television network because you have moments and all that that are even and even saturday night live gets into some moments where it's like is this funny or is it forced and a lot of drake and josh was not forced it was very acted in the teenage disney channel nickelodeon teen nick style but the material itself and where it comes from is from a very funny place. And I really like that about this show. Um, Rico, do you want to talk about what this Christmas special is? Merry Christmas, Drake and Josh. Yeah, believe it or not, it came out uh, 10 years ago. uh, (laughs) Oh, we're old. (laughs) (laughs) And, And basically... It it starts off with uh, with Drake and Josh going to the premiere mall. Drake is Santa Claus, and then Josh is a sack of toys. 
and and there's a and there's a part where Drake is is still dressed as Santa Claus, kissing this really attractive girl, and then and all of a sudden this person in, who's next to nine, who Drake is not attracted to at all, you know, tries to kiss him as well, and so. He tries to run off, and while he's distracted by that, he he meets uh, Mary Alice for the first time, who who then asks him because he's dressed as Santa Claus uh, for the best Christmas ever, and and Drake promises her that, and they cut to a Christmas party, which is on the roof. Then Josh and Drake notice there's party crashes, so Josh calls the police. The police mistake him as one of the party crashers and attempts to arrest him. And that whole thing goes horribly wrong. Poor and, Josh. Uh, and so, while Drake is trying to sort out Josh's legal troubles, Mary Alice comes up to Drake again, and it turns out that, that it, she's not just some regular kid, she's part of a foster family with five other kids and their foster mom is in the hospital. Their dad is working two jobs now. And apparently uh, the dad told him that sometimes Santa can't come to all the houses in the world. And so it's this really sad sort of story and Drake vows to keep his promise. But that then prompts Drake then to attempt to to break Josh out of prison, which he, he gets caught with Josh unconscious. Uh, and so now they're haul, both hauled into court, facing years in prison. And then, thanks to Helen, who, who apparently represents them, because there was a whole lawyer bit, the judge learns about the promise made to Mary Alice and her foster family to give them the best Christmas ever. So then the judge decides that because they have no prior criminal violations on their record, that they won't put them in jail this time, but it's contingent on the condition that he gives Mary Alice and her foster family the best Christmas ever. If they fail at doing that, then... They have to go back to prison. So the movie is mostly focused on them trying to get give Mary Alice and a foster family the best Christmas ever. And then there's this antagonist, which is Drake and Josh's parole officer. He really hates Christmas, and we learn why towards the end. He just gives Drake and Josh a really, really hard time. It's very challenging to create a holiday special that doesn't feel like the plot is recycled hallmark channel um (laughs) starting their (laughs) christmas movies in october in 2018 because they're insane um anyways um i think this one was very well done for a christmas special because it didn't try to force a plot for either one. It was a it was a plot that would very much happen in the in the universe of the television series, but it was also a very Christmassy type plot mm-hmm. utilizing the characters from the that specified television series and I think that Drake and Josh characters in this situation worked very well. There are many ways that you can do a Christmas special for a television series, and forcing characters from one franchise into a Christmas-themed special doesn't always necessarily work. So I'm really glad it did for this one. Mm -hmm. First off, was there any of like the movie-only characters that really stood out to you? Oh, goodness. I'm going to say that the older brother, Luke, Mm -hmm. is going to be the person that sticks out for me. um, Only because you always have those people that they're always down on their luck. They don't always get in the Christmas spirit. And 
you know, you see it with Scrooge and you see it with, you know, various other characters, Burgermeister, Meister Burger and all sorts of stuff. But at least with this character, with Luke, you can really understand why he's not happy and not pleased with how everything turns out because of the life situations that he has faced. Mm -hmm. It's not anything that is his fault. And that's where the trouble really is with him is that the world is, is, is a mess. And because of that, he's suffering and which is not okay. And sometimes Christmas is that one time of year where you can, you know, forget your troubles and be happy and, and get along with everyone. And sometimes it's just a reminder of all the things that you don't have. So being able to see that perspective from Luke for a, a, a teenage audience and a, and a young adult audience is, is a very important thing because people that are generally people that are watching this show are not in that circumstance are, are not in, in such negative circumstances so being able to see a character that is in those circumstances around their age and present it in such a way is very, very good. No. Okay, sorry. I'm thinking I am going all over the place and all the episodes and this movie are blending together. I was like, is this the one that ends with a wedding? No, this does not end with a wedding. No, that was the finale. Well, yes. I, well, actually, it was, I think it was supposed to be the finale, but then they aired some a few episodes after the finale. And, and for whatever reason, like they aired the episodes out of order. Oh, interesting. <sighs> why, why is TV dumb? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Because in the finale of Drake and Josh, I know Josh gets like the golden sweater vest for like being a... Mm. Um, was it like associate manager or something like that? Something like that, yeah. And and basically, in the, in the next episode that aired after that, obviously because there's a lot of order, Josh is still working at the premiere and he's not wearing that vest. <laughs> oh, jeez. And I think that's probably why they had the premiere be a model in the Christmas special because of the fire at the end of the finale. It's, I guess, presumed that the whole... Premier building burned down, so they relocated to a mall. Okay. I like that the special did have almost every character in it, because mm-hmm. Craig and Eric were in it, who were the, the, the nerdy type kids. Mm-hmm. Um, Mindy makes an appearance. I love, I love Allison, uh, who plays Mindy. She is so wonderful. I love the character of Mindy. I think she's great. And I think her and Josh really balanced well together. I also love... This is something else that that I think Dan really nails when he's doing a show. Is the casting of adult characters. He nails it. He nails the kids. But it's also just as important to nail casting the adults. And Jerry... uh, Not Jerry Trainer. Ugh... Jonathan Goldstein and Nancy Sullivan as Walter and Audrey, the parents, are just incredible. They play well off of each other. You can see the relationship between, because they're step family, you can see where Drake and Megan come from. You can see where Josh comes from. They balance well together. It's just, they're, they're so good. Honestly, it's been this this family dynamic works so well. I think the next one that I really was like, this family is so good, is Good Luck Charlie. Mm-hmm. I think the family dynamic that they had in that show also worked really well. Um, so while the family dynamic works, they took the parents out of the equation and had them go into a tropical destination where the storm hit and everything like that. So they really weren't altogether in a unit set until the end of the movie, which was a little irritating, but also like your kids can't get into shenanigans unless the adults are out of the way. Mm -hmm. Rascally kids. (laughs) (laughs) There was a couple of songs in this, right? Because they did Mm -hmm. the 12 days of Christmas. Yeah. They did a song at the big, a couple songs at the beginning too, right? Yeah. They got, 
like at the very beginning of the background there's there's an original song I think by the I forget the name it's Black House something it's Black House Mike yeah yeah it's the created original Christmas song for the very beginning of the movie and and I believe Dan Schneider uh, due to popular demand released the uh, full song to his YouTube channel I'm not sure if it's still there but I sure that other people who who got caught it definitely uh, t- ripped it and re-uploaded it so that's out there that's good and then and then at the the first song well, the only song that they play at the party on the roof is uh, a really cool rock version of Jingle Bells. Yeah. All about the rock covers. Yeah. <laughs> they are hip and cool. Apparently, uh, in that whole police chase thing when Josh falls in the back of the truck and the police are trying to to chase him down uh if if you hear closely uh the one singing that cover i forget the name of the song it's a popular christmas pop type song it's actually miranda cosgrove she recorded a version specifically for that scene how fun especially since she she has been breaking out at that point, had been breaking out into the music industry. That mm-hmm. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then I would say that there was the 12 Days of Christmas for the Christmas Caroling. Then at the end, I forget the name of the band. It's another Christmas pop song in the background. It's I believe it's called Make Some Noise, It's Christmas. So. I just, I don't know. I feel. How long did this special run? Like, what was the runtime of it? Well, it was about an hour and a half without commercials, and then about two hours with. Okay. I. When I when I hear a Christmas movie, I my my go to reference for certain things is Home Alone, mm-hmm. and Home Alone had a beautifully balanced amount of Christmas music, whether in the forefront or in the background. And mm-hmm. I always want more Christmas music in all of these movies. And I feel like this one was lacking in all of the music department. It had select good notes, but I think it could have used more. Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. dare they? Mm-hmm. They can't use the excuse we didn't have enough to choose from because that's crap. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, one thing that I... Like, I remember thinking about, like, in the first few times when I was first watching it, uh, obviously this did not happen, but I almost wonder what your, what your take would be on something like this, if if it would be feasibly possible for Dan Schneider to sort of create a spinoff based on this movie's uh, foster family that's featured with Mary Alice and... And then I believe the the other kids, uh, Trey, who's who like always goes off on a tangent. Uh, and then there's Zigfi, the the one who speaks a foreign language that they don't know. Uh, and then, like you said before, Luke, the guy, the guy who just is sort of down because of what life sort of threw at him early on. And then the twin girls, Violet and Lily, who always uh, end up fighting and apparently breaking things. 
I really thought that the whole dynamic uh, between that foster family it might have been worthy of a spinoff of its own, but I don't know. I want to hear your guys' thought on it. I think at this point, ten years later, it would not happen. Yeah, However, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but look, I mean, back then had it, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that that might have been a potential marketing thing of testing and going. Well, maybe if this goes well and this family is well received, maybe this is a possibility moving forward. Um, I. I think the tone of the movie was a little, it was really weird because you could tell it was filmed as a movie and not as a television series. So like the, some of the tones of the camera filters were darker and stuff. So that was a little weird. And I think that, I think the acting, not having the audience laughing track kind of responded weird, but having, having the dynamic of the kids interacting with each other, I think tweaking their lines a little bit and putting them into that foster situation again and separating the Drake and Josh characters from it, I think that would work as a television series. Even if it wasn't those kids specifically and it was just the foster kids family situation, I think that as a comedy would work. You would, again, have to have those really well-developed characters. There were specific quirks about each of those, um, each of the kids that, you know, clashed when they interacted with each other. And there's one that studies a lot. And there's one that goes into crazy situations. And there's one that tries weird food. And, you know, I think I think that would work in a scenario, in a in a television series, whether or not it was this these cast of kids or not. So I think it's still a possibility for it to work. One thing that they focused on, which you know was basically the entire plot of the of the special, was you know the perfect Christmas. And I, I guess my question is: Does is there a such thing as a perfect Christmas, and why? What makes the perfect Christmas versus a good Christmas or a great Christmas? And why are those the things that make it a great Christmas and a perfect Christmas? Well, well a tough question to answer, <laughs> but it's a really good one. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can try and attempt to have a perfect Christmas, but it, I mean, in reality, you think it's going to go perfectly, but then it never does. <laughs> so I, I really don't think you can have a perfect Christmas because it's like you have this scenario in your head, right? And you think it's going to play out in real life, but then it doesn't. It's like there might be one thing that's offered. I don't know. At least that's how it's always been for me. But, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, th that, yeah. I think as long as you, you're you celebrating, I mean, you shouldn't be. I, I think this was from a mo movie, too. I don't but remember was it which deck one. The but it's not really great being alone on Christmas because it's like you don't have anyone to celebrate. Um, no, I don't remember the, the, I swear it was a quote from a movie or something it's a, it's probably but, um, or a hallmark movie because there's yeah, a bajillion yeah it's just being alone on... <laughs> yeah i'm sure it was from a hallmark movie <laughs> being bitter about it no i know same <laughs> um but yeah, yeah i don't think you can i don't think there's a right or wrong way to celebrate christmas i just think it's weird when people get there are certain traditions that people have and i completely agree with them like you do what you want to do that's your because each family or each person does something very diff distinctly different that they think is the perfect christmas but when you put it into the perspective of like corporate cr perfect christmas you have to have a big christmas tree and you have to have a bajillion lights and a million ornaments <laughs> and you have to decorate your house mm -hmm. and you have to have christmas music playing and you have to have a specific meal and you have to and it's like screw all of that if i don't want any of that i'm not gonna do it and then i'm gonna be just as happy if i want to if i want to go to denny's with my son and sit there and order <laughs> chocolate milk and be told we're out and then i go regular milk's fine because i still quote to santa claus um, uh, I'll <laughs> do as I please. And then maybe one day I'll become Santa Claus if he falls off my roof. Um, <laughs> so no, I think there's each person has their distinct traditions. And I think what those traditions are is what stands out as 
their perfect Christmas. I don't think there is a such thing as a perfect Christmas, which is what one of the things that irritated me about the special is they were trying to create a basically a fake Christmas. There's no such thing as the perfect Christmas. Something's going to go wrong. You're going to get, you know, you, you try too hard to make things perfect. You're going to drive people away or drive your family away, or you're going to wish them away. And then you're going to be home alone with Macaulay Culkin. And then you're going <laughs> to, and then, and then you're going to wish them gone again two years later and they're going to be lost in New York and it's going to be a mess. Um, you know, each Christmas special, they try to they try to hyper focus on on a specific thing, and this one was creating the perfect Christmas and bringing people together. And I think bringing people together is such a huge important thing at Christmas time. Um, but you know, perfect Christmas, not so much. My thing that I do is it it is not it is not officially Christmas or the perfect Christmas until I have watched. All of my Rankin Bass specials, all of my Rudolph and Frosty and Santa and Miser Brothers and Nestor and Little Drummer Boy. And if I have not watched every single one of them in whatever order I please, by the time Christmas rolls around, I am in a panicked mess on Christmas Day and I have to just sit and marathon the rest of them. Um, other than that, like food, food will be served at some point, whether it's, you know, Christmas traditional like ham or turkey or potatoes or frozen pizza like what have you that's that's one thing i really enjoy so there's an attraction at magic kingdom called the carousel of progress and they go through each of the different scenes is a holiday at a different time period and it shows like the progress that we've made so it starts at like the turn of the century and then it goes in the 1920s and electricity's come in and all sorts of stuff so the time they get to Christmas at the end is the last scene and it's like the 90s Christmas um, it's like the Christmas of the future uh, set in 1995 um, because like they have virtual reality headsets and I was like oh this is this is a mess um, but their whole thing is like they're trying to they they just celebrated a great Christmas and they're doing Christmas dinner and it has to be the perfect dinner because last year dad ruined the Christmas turkey and now the oven like reacts to his um to the different things that he says so it's like set up into 375 so the kids start screaming out scores and he starts screaming out the scores back and it's like oh 625 and then the oven responds and says oh 625 fahrenheit and eventually the oven explodes the turkey's ruined and the dad is like so upset the mom is like my turkey it's ruined and the daughter's like anyone up to order a pizza and it's so and everyone kind of chuckles and it's like well here we go like not every christmas is going to work out and but you know you're with the people that you love and care about and there is a tree of some sort whether it's well and then and then that brings in charlie brown like you have charlie brown and his tree like it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be a it's not the material possessions or the food that serve that matters. It's the people that you surround yourself with that makes a great Christmas. And the creepy jailbreaker that comes down the chimney and brings you all sorts of random stuff like in Drake and Josh. Mm -hmm. That was my giant rant about Christmas perfection. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Which, by the way, I've actually been on the carousel of progress and I, I that was one of my favorite rides but at the same time it was like yeah I totally understand the Christmas part though I was like oh wow this is interesting summed up my thoughts too I love that ride so much and Christmas Christmas at Disney is also a completely it's completely separate topic um, but they do a good <laughs> job with inviting people in the theme parks at Disney specifically is really good about marketing to a variety of people to say, you know, you can come with your, your children or your grandparents or your blood family, or you can come with your girlfriend or with your wife or husband or what have you. And, or you can come with your small group of friends and, you know, you can have fun. And that's, they really hammer in on that at Christmas time. So now being November, it is now officially Christmas time uh, it, for the theme park industry. And you're seeing all sorts of advertisements and all sorts of like come in and welcome to the park and welcome to our family and you know christmas is for everyone and the holidays are for everyone and 
it, it's it's very inclusive, which is great. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's what this special really got back to was that Christmas is inclusive. It's about everyone, you know. Some others might not be as well off as you, but in and if you notice that, don't continue to exclude them. Figure out what you can do to make their holiday better. It is the season of giving. You should give of your talents and of yourself in order to make other people happy. And in doing so, you will become happy as well. And I, and that was really what the the end all of the special was, was giving back to those that are less fortunate. And then, in turn, making yourself happy. Yeah, and going back to what Eric said earlier, they just did a really great job of capturing that. Like, you don't really see a lot of Christmas movies that that do a, doing that sort of topic. If that makes sense. Yeah, for me, uh, I guess my gripe with the movie is not necessarily the whole perfect Christmas thing. All that is something that I guess is sort of their, their phrasing is more so the best Christmas ever, which is sort yeah. of the same thing. But my, my grape is more so with the phrase that's repeated uh, and very early on, you can't break a Christmas Yeah, that promise. irritates me too. <laughs> yeah, I completely forgot about that until you brought that up. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's... Because it's like a guilt trip thing. And I was like, why is this... The movie still would have worked so much, so well, if that line wasn't in it, really at all. Mm-hmm. But repeated, it, like you said, as much as it was, that's yeah, that was irritating. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially if you think about it, in in a hypothetical perfect world, you, you can't really break any promise, whether it's mm-hmm. around Christmas time or if it's yep. in the middle of summer. And everyone just assumes that because it's Christmas, like it 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 it, ought to, it it must mean more, and it must be more important because it's there's there's the ho ho man, and he's watching, and I'm like, why why is this so hammered in at this time of the year? This makes me so upset. Mm-hmm. Or like, or like, Christmas is the only time you should behave or be a decent person. Like, stop, stop that right now. Who are you? Mm-hmm. That was one of the things with Jingle All the Way. Is that it? it I feel like by the end of the movie, the data changed. But you know, you can't just behave or be a decent human or a decent parent or a decent child at Christmas time. That's not how life works. If that's how you operate, then I'm going to lock you up until Christmas time. And then I'll be like, okay, you can come out. But ho-ho man's watching you. (laughs) And so am I. As everyone can hear, I'm very passionate about this holiday season. But people (laughs) people celebrate it wrong. There (laughs) there are two ways of doing things. The Eric way or the wrong way. (laughs) I feel like (laughs) Christmas is done and so it, it, it's just ingrained in people's minds incorrectly. And we've gotten to this point where people just focus on the the marketing side of Christmas and the gifts and the, the purchasing. And, and I'm like, you're missing the entire point. And the stress. People focus so much, especially with Black Friday shopping. They focus so much on the stress mm. of Christmas. And I think having the time constraint on this with Drake and Josh with, you know, you have until Christmas and you have to give them the perfect Christmas and you can't pick a Christmas promise. And there's so much stress built up upon this, which yes, makes sense because that gives them a, a, a hindering point and a, a, a you know, the, the driving of the plot, but also the, them getting stressed out over this and getting all this pressure put on them, I'm like, that stresses me out. I really connect with Josh at a lot of levels throughout the television series and the special, and I'm just like, I get thrown into all these mm-hmm. stupid situations, and I'm like, why am I in the middle of this? And I feel like it's the same with this. It's <laughs> like, why am I here? <laughs> why am I Why am I having to worry about this? And, and then, you know, Drake always being the one that's trying to make the... the the realization of like, oh, Christmas is about not about me, or it's not about this thing that I want, or it's about this these other people, and 
Josh is like, yes, I've told you that from the beginning. Like, stop being stupid. Why does he, why, poor Josh, he has to deal with stupidity all of his life. <laughs> and bullying from his sister. Yeah, that's the whole thing, too. It's it's like, parents expect you to be specifically nice to, to your family at this time. And I think that that, that three-sibling dynamic is, is a perfect example of, like, they fight constantly throughout this entire series. You cannot expect them to be perfect for one day. Like... The, and that's a huge expectation for every family. You you should be expecting them to be wonderful and nice to each other for the most part, mm-hmm. all the year round. Why are you dumb? Why why are people in their mindset so naive? <sighs> Just want to shove them in a stocking. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least as it relates to uh, to Megan in this movie as well as, I think, the only other Drake and Josh movie that was released, Drake uh-huh. and Josh Go Hollywood. Uh, mm-hmm. one, thing that, uh, one thing that I noticed with regards to Megan, it's probably more so with the Go Hollywood ones than this Christmas one, that she seems out of character as far as like being nice compared to how she is in the... TV series. I think part of it is you can tell from certain episodes of the TV series, while she does pick on her siblings in a sibling-like relationship, she also does care mm-hmm. about them because there are points where she is running mm-hmm. around with them or trying to help them solve situations or resolve situations for them and then, you know, then turns around it is and, like, you know, throws a water balloon or something like that. Um but I think I think by the time that this point rolled around, the show had been off the air or had ended or concluded for like over a year at this point, and mm-hmm. you know, the, probably about a year and a half. And I think just through the course of natural puberty, I think she just matured naturally, and we just didn't get to see that. In the public eye, as far as a te- in the television, in the context of the television series of these characters, because the show had been off the air, mm-hmm. so I think it, they just felt it's time to mature this character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can I can see that, but uh, at least with regards to like uh, Jake and Josh go Hollywood, like like she spends. Uh, as what happens is they they put Megan on the wrong plan. And she's supposed oh, to go yeah. think to Denver, yep. and and she ends up in Hollywood, and then Jake and Josh end up getting you know, it again mixed up with criminals who apparently <laughs> stole something from the treasury, and so now so now they're essentially held captive by these criminals, and Megan doesn't really know where they are, or what exactly is going on with them. And during that time, she s- seems to have a slightly uncharacteristic uh, care about them, at least for that point in yeah. the series. And I will say, though, that in the climax of that movie, uh, the, when, when Megan turns on the fans to get her brothers out of the situation with the with the mm-hmm. counterfeit money she does end up grabbing a bunch of counterfeit money and and she uses it to pay her limo driver yeah. <laughs> you're right all right merry christmas streak and josh final thoughts well for me uh all it probably isn't like the the best uh, in terms of like Christmas specials and movies and things like that. It's definitely been something that is uh, very close to me around this time of year, and I watch it every year since it came out. I do remember watching it the first time. I don't remember all the details, but I do remember um, enjoying it and having it be the highlight of my Christmas that year. So I really enjoyed this movie. I just wish I could remember all the context. 
It's really funny because I feel like mm-hmm. every time I do a podcast, it's like it's like I'm playing Celine Dion and I'm just like, it's all coming back. It's all coming back <laughs> to me now. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, because I was like, I do not remember very much of this. And then as we were talking about it, it was like, oh, I remember way more of this than I thought. Um, I just needed to, to get the old brain moving. Um Nickelodeon is very hit or miss with their movies, and I think this one was a very well done Nickelodeon movie. I think I agree with Rico. Well, this is not by any means a phenomenal Christmas special. It does a very excellent job of combining the Christmas season with the Drake and Josh characters, and the situation they get into is something outrageous but also very different than what we've seen in other christmas specials it's not lovey-dovey it's not it's it's a fun christmas movie and that's what i enjoy about it and i and again going back to the character dynamics these character dynamics work well even in this situation which is so important and i enjoy this special very much and I think it was a good way to bring back these characters for one last hoo ha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably like the funniest scene that I remember from this movie uh, is uh, is one when they are, are first out of prison for the first yeah. time, and and Drake pulls out this GPS he bought online for six dollars, and it gives him directions, but it's. Uh, but it's without any sort of warning. Like, turn right oh, in five yeah, feet. Oh, yeah, yeah. And at the end, uh, it says they arrived when they haven't. And apparently, what I found out is that if you turn on closed captionings with a special white when he throws it out the window, you can, it, you can hear the GPS say recalculating, but... And you can't hear this next bit that it says, and it says malfunction. <laughs> yeah. My God, they're so funny. Well, it's what's great about that too is um, there's mm-hmm. there's apps now that you know malfunction real bad, and sometimes they'll do that kind of crap, and it's like ugh. So it's definitely something that's super relatable. Yeah, with I uh, you know exactly what you mean. Like my, like I think it was still in high school when Apple unveiled their. Uh, I don't think it was still in high school. I think I just graduated, but when Apple unveiled their Maps mm-hmm. program, and uh, I, and if you don't know anything about where, where I live, there's there was a location of an old high school that has since been knocked down and. There are now condos in a park there, and then they built a new high school in a completely different location. But if you go on, if you went on Apple Maps like when it first came out, it still showed the local high school at the old location. Oh, yep. Google Maps will also do that, too. Still. As a friend of mine once said, it's totally fine. Technology sucks. (laughs) Yep. I'm like, come on, guys, get your life together. (laughs) <laughs> Alright, ready to head out? Yeah, so this has been an interesting discussion on both Merry Christmas Drake and Josh as well as the Drake and Josh series as a whole. And so, until next time, this has been a journey beyond the lens. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Lens. The intro music is work. That's W-E-R-Q by Kevin McCobb. It is available under a Creative Commons Attribution License and can be downloaded for free at Incompetech.com. Beyond the Lens is a ReCore Entertainment production. Rico, you better not have stolen his drink. No. <laughs> I hear I hear bits and pieces of conversations and that is the one that particularly stood out. <laughs> <laughs> mm.